good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. Now, for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standard on talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals and about whatever it is we have decided to talk about. The title of tonight's show is Topical Issues. As of the date of this show's recording, the 24th of April, 2013. And uh, what we've decided to talk about is going to go all over the map because my good friend, dear friend, and professional associate, Jimmy Moglia, is my guest this evening. We're going to take the entire hour to talk about what he wants to talk about. And I'm going to see if I can throw you a few curve questions. Absolutely. And for, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I've been absent, absent from, from, uh, from a cable channel for, for some time for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. You've been missed. Uh, oh, thank you. Well, it's very nice of you to say so. As, as, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's true, but I'm glad you said it. <laughs> um, <laughs> in any event, uh, as, as, you, as I like to say, as it is true, and as you probably know, I am addicted to what is totally, utterly, and incontrovertibly useless. So, <laughs> so, Don't look at me when you say useless that way. <laughs> so during this time, I've done a few things, and uh, uh -huh. um, to, uh, you viewers who are your viewers, mm -hmm. viewers of the channel, may remember, know or remember that for a good number of years, I've uh, produced. I produced a program called Shakespeare's Views on the news. And I guessed it a couple of times. And you, you, you were also Always with me. Uh, yes, sir. And um, then uh, <clears throat> there have been some technical issues of the, the studio, there were, there were changes and so forth, so sure. that was interrupted. But in the meantime, in the meantime, I, uh, on, the, on, the, on the stream, on the length, oh, excuse me, as a follow-on to your Daily Shakespeare, an arsenal of verbal weapons, to drive your friends into action and your enemies in, into despair. You want to hold it up now or wait till later? Yeah. Well, it, as I always say, it's a good book for two reasons. It's, a, it's a <clears throat> multitasking. If you cannot use it as a book, you can use it as a paperweight. It's, a, <laughs> it's about three and a half pounds. Is this how it's going to be the rest of the hour? Well, <laughs> that, that's all, that all depends on you. However, uh -huh. in the, as I said, in the, in the continuing stream of uselessness, I decided that there are three, there are three main main uh, uh, three heroes of literature in, in through through history are mm -hmm. Homer, mm -hmm. Shakespeare, mm -hmm. and Dante, Dante Alighieri in Italy. Of course, mm -hmm. Homer is in Greek, and although I studied, I studied Greek for five years and Latin for eight, and then I discovered that the previous the future employers had no interest whatsoever in dead languages, so I had to do something else. And this, but, this deep knowledge of all these people he's talking about has gotten, gotten into his brain and he's hard to talk to for a while, but uh, I love it. <laughs> You're brilliant, Jimmy! <laughs> I, 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 I'm, absolute, I'm, I'm a master at saying, at saying nothing in the greatest number of words. How but, are you feeling right now? Let's back oh, up a little bit. Oh, I am, I would say I'm fine. I, I, I quote you Shakespeare. Like to the time of the year between the extremes of hot and cold, neither sad nor happy. But I'm happy to be here, though. Happy to be with you, and thank you. <laughs> Have you memorized this book in its entirety? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> but but but, uh, but as a, as I hope I show the viewers in the program, I've come up with a system. But I will talk about it later. I just sure. want to bring you, uh, say a few, few more things related. Part of the reason I haven't done the show is that I dedicated my time to build my a website on Your Daily Shakespeare. And of course, the website is called www.yourdailyshakespeare.com. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had to learn a little bit how to do it, which is not, not overly difficult, but all difficulties are easy when they are known, as Shakespeare would say. So I didn't know about it, so I had to learn it. But now it's going pretty well. By going pretty well, meaning that it is very well, at, well attended. And one of the delights, or rather useless delights, of, of, of holding a website of this type is that you get viewers from, from all over the world. And uh, I am sometimes surprised. I've got one very faithful viewer from the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> and, I've just, and maybe by association, there is another island up there called Reunion, or Reunion, because it's French. 
they got some viewers there. I'm going to stop you now, because as you remember, the show goes in two parts. The first part is the bio segment, who you are, and ask you some details about where you were born, that kind of stuff. And then we'll get into the subject matter of the show, topical issues and what you're talking about now. Can we go in? Because there are some viewers who haven't seen you for a long time, and I want to tell them who you are and where you came from. I am your subject here, and you're the feudal lord, so I'm ready to, <laughs> ready talking to listen about to feudal. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And your name is Jimmy Molia. Moglia? How do you pronounce it in Italian? It's, it's Molia, but to misquote Oscar Wilde, it doesn't matter how people pronounce my name as long as they talk about me. So. <laughs> and they talk about you. And your full name is? I feel Jimmy Moglia. Is, Moglia. There, is there a middle name? No. <laughs> <laughs> How come they didn't give you another name, Jimmy? Well, um, there are either can have too many names or too few. I prefer two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, if I were to ask your best friend, who is Jimmy Molia? What would the, your best friend say? He or she would say, Jimmy is what? Fill in that for me. Totally unclassifiable. <laughs> I'm out of here. Uh, can we end the show now? <laughs> and uh, when and where were you born? I was born a long time ago and did not live happily ever after. <laughs> However, I was born in the city of Turin or Torino in Italy. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, I moved to another city, it was Genoa, which is a little bit further down. When was that? What year was that? Uh, when I was 10, I was moved to Genoa. And, uh -huh. then, and then I went to university, to the college there. And as I mentioned before, I studied Latin, I studied Greek. And I found out it was very difficult to make a living with the student languages. So I had to take a different direction in order to... to, uh, to um, Assuage the 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 pangs of, of hunger, so, but um, and so I became a, an engineer, an electronic engineer, and so I earned my honest living by doing that, working for a, a large corporation, which shall be, remain nameless, but it was a large corporation, and I was the marketing manager. Will you talk about your dishonest living also? I am <laughs> I'm above board, by <clears throat> by several orders of magnitude, unfortunately. Anyway. <laughs> Yes. However, however, um, then after a while, I, I, the the company I, I was I had a, um, I was a marketing manager for the company for the Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, mm. and um, working out of the island of Guernsey in the Channel Islands, and it was during the time that I developed two passions, <laughs> one the passions for reading because I, my, my work involved a lot of travel and so a lot of, of wasted time. So I, that's I, that, is, I, that is how I developed this passion that eventually led at the, at the book of your daily Shakespeare. The other incentive, the other incentive for writing the book is that I became dramatically bored at all corporate meetings and uh, because corporate meetings usually People who speak, they don't. They keep on going, 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 and sometimes they, they could, they could be a little slightly more concise, and that's being euphemistic. So w at one point, I, on a on, on a plane, I found out a beautiful, a beautiful quotation on Richard III, that uh, represented to me, <coughs> in close, what I felt about the meetings. I said, at this point, there must be, there must be a book, that ties Shakespearean quotations with everyday lives. Mm -hmm. I looked and I searched and I went to all over the places, found none. The, only, the, the closest thing was a little book printed in 1832. The idea was there, but it was a very small uh, font number six, approximately, so you would have, you would have a, an incredible sight to see it. To, and it did not have the analytical index. So I decided, well, <clears throat> as always Oscar Wilde you say, if I want to read a good book, I write it, but not as an exaggeration. <laughs> no. So I uh, decided the, <laughs> the book did not exist. I had to write it. Mm -hmm. And it has, uh, I did not do it for the purpose of either fame or fortune or both, because to make a living as a writer is almost as good as making a living with dead languages. So I did not. But that is, that is how it came about. How many pages, Jimmy? 1,400. Oh, 
my God, can I do this overnight? Yes. Oh, no, no, two days, two days. <laughs> but the, the idea, it's a reference book. So whenever you want to, for, for somebody who wants to um, or has to express himself in public, mm -hmm. um, then um, it's a good, a good, good resource because as we know, Shakespeare, along with Homer and Dante, almost dealt with all aspects of human life. And uh, so there, it is likely that anything that, that has to do with any aspects of life will be dealt with in a poetic manner or in a very incisive, oratorical, precise, forceful manner in Shakespeare, and therefore will find its way in the book. Well, those people now who you admire, their, their perception and their... Con a concept of life and what humans are about. Uh, did, they, did they leave anything out? Probably not. I, be, between the three of them, none. No, not. And this is why. But the, one of, by the way, one of we call one of the reasons why we call letters humanities. And you're, you, we all we have been part of the humanist group and humanist humanities letters. They're, they're letters called humanities, not because they have to. They are written, but because they are design or they were invented or they were deployed or they were written in order to hopefully improve what is under goes under the general description of human conditions and of life if you like so that is humanity there is a reason behind it other than uh, than uh, putting some ink on some white paper what do you think the chimpanzees and gorillas and bonobos what do you think they would think about your concept about what's important in human existence? They probably have their own rules, but I have not, I didn't have much time to, to understand their language. But. <laughs> That's next for you. <laughs> I have one more trick question. Yes. As you know, I always have a couple of trick questions for sure, my guests. Sure. We were talking about your birth. Why were you born, Jimmy? Why? It's a question that I've been asking myself for a long time without giving a precise answer. Would you hazard an answer for our guests? Um, I, it's it's a very it's a, it's an important question, but it's a multi too many too many. Um, I would say it's absolute chance. It's absolute um, mo like most everything is chancy. The more we attempt to regulate our lives, the more we learn. In my view, the chance is the dominant factor that prevails on life. So I would assume I would give to chance. I would assign to chance the reason for my current present here as well. Yes, yeah, so then does that thinking fit in with your professing uh, human, being a humanist? Yes, I think so. And you had a religious affiliation before you declared that you were a humanist? Um, I, as most people growing up in Mediterranean countries, I came up, I was born a Catholic. Oh, bless you, my son. Thank you. Been there, done uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was raised in the church with all the usual trappings and paraphernalia, including instructions and masses. But eventually, I, a long time ago, I, I abandoned it. And so I am what you call an agnostic. Mm -hmm. I would say atheist, but see, to say an atheist is a self-contradictory thing because because God is not an analytical, an, analytical, an analytical proposition. So agnostic is a better way to express it. Mm -hmm. Do you miss your Catholicism? None at all. However, nothing. But um, what, is it, what, is, what I find interesting for myself is that although I am an agnostic and I think the whole thing is a religion is essentially a, a, a superstition, but I am not at all anti-clerical and in fact uh, I, I, I derive much enjoyment from visiting churches, and I see a profound, in my view, a quixotic idea, but see a profound uh, presence or task or objective for the church to be the conservators, the conservers of historical tradition. So if at one point uh, the, the priesthood were to be, to be suddenly somewhat magically converted into historians, I will probably return to the fold, not so much in terms of religious stuff, but in terms of, of human participation to the conservation of tradition. And what's important, what's ultimately important, that the question comes to mind as I'm listening to you now saying what you just said. Yeah, let me check my cheat sheet again here. And we talked about your cultural heritage and national heritage. 
And we touched on briefly your uh, formal education. Is there anything more that you can say about your formal education that would be of interest to the viewers? I, as I think so, I, uh, as I put in my resume for those who want to, to, to watch my, uh, to, to go to the, to the website, mm -hmm. <clears throat> my strength is that I have particular passion for everything which is remarkably useless. And, um, and I attempted to make a living and after, after the, you asked me before, after working for a company, I started mine. I, so I run a company for 25 years, a computer company which came out out of chance. It was a product, it was a product that could not help but being useful to people. And um, I had- 25 no, years of that. Yes. And uh, I, did not, I did not have experience in, in founding companies, but um, that was at the time, t the computer business was very difficult, different at the time from now. And mm -hmm. so the, co the company was, the product was successful and we survived for a long time. And then on 2010 said, this is it. I have kind of <laughs> So I decided to do this type of stuff. And in fact, and in fact, last November, the Tuscan region, Tuscan, decided to publish my next book, which is called, which is, it's in Italian, because you cannot translate Shakespeare into another language. You, people have tried, but it doesn't oh, sound too yeah. good. Same thing, you cannot, you can, well, Longfellow has translated Dante in English, but it, 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 you know, it doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. but any, the title translator in Italian is almost the equivalent of Shakespeare, where he says, Our Daily Dante, 3,500 ways to get away with it, with Dante. <laughs> however, however, mm -hmm. sorry, unless you wanted a question. No, please, go ahead. I, um, with all this <coughs> plethora, with all this abundance of quotations, and then a question asks, how could you possibly find, use them, or can, can you possibly remember them? And even actors, as you know, you've been an actor yourself, you know, mm -hmm. there is a certain task. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, I had asked myself, is there a way that I can attempt uh, to, is a way I can attempt to try to, in order to remember more quotations by heart than, than I would like? And I tried all system listening of uh, the recording, etc., writing down, the, and eventually I came up. I came up with a system, which actually is not entirely new. The inventor of the art of memory was was a um, guy by the that we'll, we'll go to later if we have time. But anyway, he was a Greek living in a small island, and through a sequence of circumstances, he found out a system to remember to remember everything. Shall we keep going and talk about that again a little later on? If you wish, because yeah. I have some examples so that I, I have to, to tell them. Okay. I want to get through with the bio stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. But you, uh, you have so much to say until I, I don't want to interrupt you because it's always interesting can, to hear you. You can always interrupt me. Yeah. Uh, any other education worth mentioning out, outside of your formal education? Uh, never mind the education of being alive and living and experiencing life on you, a day, you, you a moment to moment basis. You stole my words. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes, of course, but it, it's it really even too, too even long to remember all the things that you try to attempt to learn. My view, which is almost rhetorical to say, is that, that life is as normal as a continuous living experience. And so whether whether one uh, defined goals uh, written by formal education or not is not relevant. I don't think the listing of my of courses or things that I've learned about would only be good on a resume, which I now don't write anymore anyway. So unless you're just nosy and curious like me. No, curi no a cu curiosity, I think, is the best is 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 the, the the best description under which we can categorize knowledge, and so uh, that is essentially that's essentially it. In fact. Um, I, all these things about the literature so I didn't come up because I wanted to take a particular course in, in this. It just came up and said, well, in order to be able to, um, to learn how other people have expressed thought in the most concise, brilliant, aesthetic, and powerful way, what other way there is but reading? The restless mind, the restless spirit, the restless human being, do those terms fit for you? Um, you know, <laughs> there is not a wise man in 20 that will praise himself. So that since I could praise... You are so darn modest, you just frustrate no, 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 me. No, 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 it's a question of modesty, realism. It's, uh, 
Ah, restless, yes, because, if, because if, unfortunately when we are completely at rest, we are in a condition that we try to postpone as long as possible, so uh, we, don't, we don't want to do that. So as one is, turns alive, then one attempts to, be, to learn something new, and that is, I would say, a very concise way to express a philosophy, yes. In quiet moments when you're not busy with your brain, uh, do you experience something worth talking about or saying a few words about being with yourself? What is that kind of an answer does that conjure up for you when you're alone with yourself? Um, I think uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very good question, but a, a short answer would really not do justice to it. So, yeah. uh, and I have, we have to be short here. I think that it's the more one, uh, the, the Greek used to say, not to say, know yourself first. But yes. no, no, no knowledge of yourself first is, is a, is a, it's a good thing to say. But it's really not all that practical because all the aspects, you're a psychologist, you're a PhD in psychology, so you know that the more we think ourself, we think about ourselves objectively uh, from, from the outside looking at oneself. Um, the, in my opinion, it's likely that one cannot give ourselves a good, <laughs> give oneself a good answer because there are many aspects of ourselves that the very fact of looking inside ourselves uh, obscures. That is my view. I would characterize it as being aware of myself rather than looking at myself because of course I've got to use my brain to, to, to have some sort of a way of of, of characterizing it so I can recognize this in case I want to recall it a, a, a year from now or six months from now. So as I am aware of my moment of being alive, like here I'm looking at you, there is something going on in my feeling, in my gut, in my spirit, if I may, being a humanist, can you accept by saying, by, in my spirit, that can be memorable. And those are the moments I live for. Oh, sure, yeah. the aesthetic experience, yes. Yes. Uh, Oh, there is no question about it. It's just that uh, uh, thought itself is awareness. So, uh, whether you distinguish whether the thought about yourself or the thought about something else, to me is that not very critical. At least that's my opinion. And, and you can always disagree. As Mark Twain used to say, in all matters of opinion, our adversaries are insane. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let me continue with my questions. <laughs> You're good. And we talked about your work in retirement life. And you have a partner, a wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, or anything like that in your life no, now? No, no. I am I I live with a cat. I have a she-cat who my son found, and uh, um, I'm single. Uh -huh. Would the cat be jealous if you were to bring home uh, a, a companion? No, because the cat is very introspective. It's a very, it's, besides being, it's a, the cat is essentially a philosopher animal. It's a philo very philosophic animal. So now, where are you taking he, me? And he has a very good sense of humor. So <laughs> the two go to. So he, uh, are you available for some companion or uh, something? I, I don't. I really don't think about. I don't. Don't think about these things or don't express myself about it. And, um, and of course, you know, anytime I ask a question that you don't want to answer, you can. Oh, no, this is not because. Answer. Uh, to say, <laughs> if I say to her, available, I look like a car for hire and there's somebody <laughs> <laughs> for rent. All right. Next question. Any children or grandchildren? I do have two, two boys. I know. Um, yeah. And uh, the one of them in Vietnam in an exploratory trip. If it's not the younger, the other one works in a bank here in Portland. Mm -hmm. They live independently, and, um, and I, we see them uh, regularly. They, every Sunday or two Sundays or every, every other Sunday. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's good, yeah. Do they appreciate your cooking as well as I do? I've been over to your house a few times for dinner, you know. <laughs> um, I have a very limited range, you see, very limited um, a repertory of cooking, so I cannot consider myself. What I've experienced was just wonderful, and that's enough for me. Let's we'll do that again. Okay. Uh, your political persuasion, are you left, right, center, or uh, a cheap partier, or what, a neo Nazi? <laughs> <laughs> it's, this, is one of the, this is one of the positions where really uh, the, the decision on, who, on what one is depends on the, on the person who. Cast the opinion. Sure. Um, 
I'm for humanity and common sense. And so if anybody um, shows or um, displays abilities or thoughts or actions that comply or that are <clears throat> consonant to this principle, I would agree with him irrespective of the party that he is on. But I have no political affiliation, mm -hmm. none. On the political continuum, would you hazard as the where you would be in the middle, or the left, or the right? The p political continuum, as we appreciate, as we uh, uh, consider it, being uh, Americans. Oh yeah, I would say that it would be left, 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 but not, <laughs> but not not because of any radical b beliefs or anything else, but just mm -hmm. uh, seeing the g getting a, an instant picture of what is going on, of what we perceive as going on uh, as being the political momentum, the, um, the collective consciousness of whatever you want to call it, being that the situation, I would say that um, based on that, I would say I'm on the left. What does it mean? For example, if, if somebody says we have to, if we to increase the number of prisons and cut social security, I would say that's nonsense. But and so that would classify me a left it, left it. War on drugs, I think it's a war on the poor. That would make me a left it, left it and this type of stuff. But I'm not saying this thing, I'm not saying that the war on drugs, maybe we can talk about it later, is a war on the poor just because to make a statement. Because there's evidence, just as there's evidence that the war on drugs is actually a war on the poor. So once you admit the evidence, then you can say, yes, this is it, and therefore that classifies me as a leftist. But not because I want to throw bombs or, or an anarchist or things like this. So. Litmus test, two little questions, my litmus test about where you are on the political continuum. How do you see Barack Obama and how do you see Ronald Reagan uh, uh, on the political continuum? W were they left or right or are they what are they? I will answer by saying that Ronald Reagan, I was a, I was a youngster then. When I, when I saw Ronald Reagan uh, elected, How about my, George W. Bush my, my, my uh, hands fell, arms fell down because ah, I could, without saying now, nobody can prove it, but I said, this is going to be end up very, very badly. And it did end up very, very badly. The, the, from, from, from Afghanistan, 9-11, everything else, it all starts from that point. There were some few terrorist acts, terrorist things in, in the 70s, but nothing, nothing along, along the scale. What do you think of Obama and his performance so far? I'll give you, I'll give you an indirect answer. <laughs> if you, do you ever give a direct answer, Jenny? I do, I do. But the, the indirect answer, I will lead to the, to the direct answer. Of a few years ago, there was, you know, the two, there was Benetton, there was one, and Cal Calvin Klein, Calvin Klein, Benetton, two. Mm -hmm. Leading fashion uh, providers, purveyors. And they started advertising on magazines, um, models who were black and who had HIV. And so it was designed to brand. It was a, the brand of Benetton was trying to project integration, uh, racy lifestyle and things like this. So I see Obama as a brand. Obama is a brand and as such, he, in my view, he is, he is but he only executes what he has been Directed to execute and say, I don't see him as a, it, at all an independent, an independent uh, actor. Okay, uh, that's, we're going to have to take a break in a couple of minutes, but I got to ask you one more question. Uh, any persons from the past or alive today that you particularly admire, admired, or look up to, other than William Shakespeare? Oh, there are other things. Yeah. Well, in my lifetime, uh, Jimmy Carter, I put it top of the American presidents. Mm -hmm. And of course, although it's almost like rhetorical because everybody says it, but it's not true, of course, Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. That's a it. Any, any people from history that you uh, dislike uh, enough to mention? Dislike? That is more difficult because uh, history is always written by the winners. So yeah. it's only by uh, looking carefully at the, what other various people said about the person uh, who is said to have done this good or this and bad, that one can get a biased, op a, a, a more balanced opinion. So, well, yeah. of people that particularly I found it always particularly interesting, there are so many. I would say from the 17th century, I would say Voltaire is one that comes to mind. It is, uh, 
because he, he essentially he, he opened he opened the uh, field of thought in directions that were not possible before, and more recently, of course, it inspired me in Bertrand Russell. In yeah. fact, in fact, in fact, if it were up to me, at school I would have religious instructions because we are traditions and so forth. But I would also make it optional to read the book Why I Am Not a Christian, which is not an indictment of Christianity, yes. but it, but it is a description of the reasons why religion, irrespective of what it is. Um, is not all as good as it seems. Yes, we're on the same page so far. So let's take a little break here and catch my breath because just thinking of questions to ask you tires me out, Jimmy. I don't know whether it's a compliment, it's a threat. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Can we take a break, Mr. E? We have a mic. Thanks for staying tuned. And for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don that you're watching is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I have you inter interesting guests like Jimmy Moglia here about who he is and uh, what we've decided to talk about and topical issues. And when Jimmy and I get going, I don't know where we're going, but I love it. <laughs> so thanks again for coming on, Jimmy. So let's, the second half of the show, so to speak, let's get to some of the questions that might lead into other interesting stuff that I'm sure the viewers will appreciate. Shall we? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Uh, what is the function of literature, if any? Leading to a brief discussion on the never mind. Let's answer the question. Well, as I mentioned before, we, we briefly talked about it before. Literature <coughs> is connected with humanities. In fact, when people take what are you taking at university or college, I'm taking humanities, it is understood that they are studying mostly literature as well as history. But history, good history is written with good letters. So but the function of literature and the function of humanities is to improve the conditions of human nature and the conditions of living. And if we look, yeah, this looks like almost a, a platitude, but if you look at history, the great, the great advances that we have, after all, apart from the many drawbacks, that we have been able to achieve have always been trailblazed, so to speak, by a great writer. In fact, Many, it's not my opinion, but many admit that the, some of the virtues of the Anglo-Saxon, quote unquote, civilization would not be there had it not been for Shakespeare. And equally, the Italian language, for example, would not be there had not been in for Dante. So here you have typical two examples of how one person can influence civilization through letters, two persons, mm -hmm. respectively. You know, civilization, that term has a lot of connotations and meaning, particularly for me as a humanist and for me as a seeker, always looking for new ideas and to challenge my own ideas and thinking. Uh, so we're civilized, and I think about, is a challenge for you, the other uh, uh, cultures around the world centuries ago in Africa and the Middle East and Latin America, uh, were they civilized or not? You're talking who, please? And like the the Incas, and and. Uh, well, civil, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you you caught me on the on the on the elusive meaning of words. Yeah, civilization is a very is a very broad term, and civilization. If we go to it, we would 
to have a long time to discuss. Well, as a broader term to describe a system whereby people live together. And uh, in insofar as the Incas and the Egyptians and the Greeks and yes. the Romans yes. and the Scandinavians and the Normans and, and the Arabs and the uh, Iranians Some more and blacks and browns, uh, please. Please. You're, you're talking about the, your Anglo-Saxons and yeah. all the white people, and I resent well, that. Bec no, because we're, we're here. <laughs> if, I've, if, if we were conducting this in Tehran, we would talk about the Farsi, about the Farsi civilization. Uh, because, the civil, as, you, as you're right, you know, there are many civilizations, there are many systems of people living together, and each one of these, insofar as they have left for us the products of their system civilization, they are worthwhile of study and they are worthwhile of examination and also appreciation. If you look at the Inca art, it's beautiful. So is the Aztec art. So uh, my limiting to the what are called the Anglo-Saxon civilization only because we live in an Anglo-Saxon country after all. Okay. Any more about that before I ask you the next question? Well, we could go, we, we could expand on this almost endlessly. I know, so Jimmy, with I you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is the role of education in the development of society? What's the role of education in the development of society? Well, yeah, I think you alluded to it or touched on it earlier in some of your comments. Well, the... Um, it is a such a fundamental thing that it almost, again, sounds like a part here to say what is the role of education. But if we want to just briefly cast a glance to, to, uh, to, to some aspect of which I think are very important uh, in my view. We, uh, all schools, uh, a little bit less in Europe now, all schools, and where all starts on, on, on children, on, um, with uh, religious instructions. And which is fine, you know, so how can you say not to want a religious instruction? Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, I think it should be balanced, saying this is the religious of your, of religion of your family or where you're here. But you should also know, even at this time, that there is a different point of view on the same issue. And uh, whereas by, this has happened to me, to you and to many, to many, many people, we have to grow or to live for a long time before we begin to question what has been what has been said to us and has been to be said to be accepted as such because when you're a child you accept everything that you're told because yeah. you have no other way of saying so i don't think it would be i would say, quixotic to or rather um, paradoxical to think that you can in, in you can instill critical thought or critical thinking into a child but at least expose him to different points of view may be start be what I called the function of education. Uh -huh. An educated man, could we look at somebody in some of those civilizations that you mentioned before? And I'm thinking about the brown and races or creation. I know or black people around the globe. Could you say any of those uh, respected uh, individuals in those societies and cultures could be educated? But give what we go into a, edu education uh, here is education the, the the etymology of education is a, to pull out pull out of of the flock we need to pull out of the flock insofar as anybody has some um, anyone irrespective of color race or anything else has an individual th as a thought which advances in his own way <laughs> himself as well as the people he lives with he is an educated person and so he is worthwhile for mm -hmm. what he says. Okay. What are the legacies of Hugo Chavez and Margaret Thatcher? Why do you say both of those names in the same question? Because they represent the, the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> opposite. Will you elaborate, Jimmy? <laughs> <laughs> they represent the opposites. Um, the, the, well, I think it was interesting to see, very interesting to see that the funerals in this case, apart from them, regrettably, um, the, I would say one is more regrettable than the other, but uh, the, the, the difference in the funerals is so typical of, so in, indicative, such a symbol of their legacies that we should just, just by looking at the reaction to the funerals, we can deduct, we can deduce what the legacy would be. 
in the case of Chavez, we had people from all over the world actually crying or, or uh, expressing dismay and, and uh, absolute discomfort, it's more than discomfort, pain at having lost such a symbol of social advancement. Whereas Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, has, has gone down, will go down in history as, as you see, as the symbol of everything, of the destructions of the social progress that have been achieved from the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. So whereby, so the, the, the one percent and all the big wigs that went to, with all these praises and, and uh, about Mrs. Thatcher at their funeral were really a lim very limited section. It was the one percent that was um, grieving for, uh, for Thatcher, the 99 percent was grieving for Chavez. I think perhaps their grieving was not for Thatcher, but for what uh, Thatcher stood for and her advancing the interests of yeah, the 1%. Yeah, the 1%, yes, but yeah. So we call it grieving because whether it was felt or displayed doesn't matter, but anyway, there was a picture of the people say, oh, how, how good she was and so forth. So how great, how great a person. Then Russia was the twin, the intellectual twin of Ronald Reagan, as we all know. So uh, the two went hand in hand. The two went hand in hand. How about Hugo Chavez? Uh, you want to say a few more words about him? Because I've got a question uh, about him. Um, I think it was a, a revolutionary person, and um, it's powerful. A, a revolutionary, powerful person. revolutionary person. Revolutionary <laughs> person. I have to give you an anecdote. I have an anecdote. Please. Very, very, and it's not disrespectful at all to give you an idea about how Chavez, my son, my younger son. Uh, we are all feline lovers, and he, he was told that somewhere on the on the um, one of the trail, spring water trail, mm -hmm. there was a place where there are kittens. Spring water trail, that's here in, uh, in Portland. Portland, yes. Portland. So he was told there was a <coughs> was a litter of kittens, new ones. So he went there and picked two ones. They say picked two ones and brought them home, and he said we call them one we call them Ugo, the other one we call Chavez. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and we want we want to even try to, but it turns out it turns out that they were not. Males, but were females. Then one disappeared because he left. Was wilder. The other one we called him Chavette. So in Lewis, <laughs> <that's what laughs> feminized. So, feminized. <laughs> but you know, Hugo Chavez represents a revolutionary thought and really a, a, a practical desire to provide some progress to what is an immense misery, and that otherwise was immense misery and remains, and. He was able to do that based on notwithstanding a dramatic fight uh, by the 1% in Venezuela to pull him out. Apart from the coup, you know, they, I was just thinking they, uh, he, they were complaining they were in, there's no freedom, but there is, um, from what I've seen, some of the things that are the sketch, there, was a, there is a uh, television station who every day v piled all sorts of bad things and insults. And I was trying to think, just imagine if here at CNN were to do the same thing to Obama. They would probably, they would probably, they couldn't do it because they would, they would probably be pulled off the air or something dramatic would happen that they would be forced to close. And just imagine if through this propaganda there were a coup and for a moment the president were to pull out, CNN would be, those people would be killed. <laughs> Evolutionary human being. I've never heard that term before. It makes me think a little further, a little deeper. I have uh, a, a deep sort of a feeling and, and a sadness at his being killed by my government. That's an awfully dangerous thing to say. I'm accused of being a conspiracist. But we have a history of the 20 some attempts at killing. Fidel Castro, oh, sure. and we have a record of like, like uh, Allende, and around the world the American empire is advanced by killing serious opposition to American dominion. So why should it be so weird to think that perhaps they got to Hugo Chavez and managed to kill him so that 20 minutes, 24 hours after he's gone, the cause of his demise has disappeared. Stop me! I'm going no, crazy. No, no, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, these things they, logically they, they make much sense, but this is difficult to prove. So it will of be, course, um, difficult to prove. So uh, we want to be sure and cover whatever you, yeah, else you I want to talk to, about. 
Yes, we don't have many minutes, but as an interruption. Sure. Um, one of the things that I was mentioning before, it is good to have the quotations, but how can you remember? Mm -hmm. So I came up with a system which is, which is based on antique research, you know, from Quintilian and so forth. Antique but, research. But, but it is updated through modern software, so it makes it, uh, it, makes it fun to do so. So I, would, I cannot go through the, through the book and explain the system exactly, the, the steps. But I would like to ask the studio to put up Three quotations, uh, or rather, this is the this is the first. Because you don't have to worry about it. it is, but this is a by by looking at this and uh, and I explain it in my book how it is done. Uh -huh. You will remember. Now this is this quotation says it is our fast intent. And which book do you explain this? Is this comes from King Lear. It's the beginning of King Lear. It's all Shakespearean quotations. Okay, of course. It is our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them to younger strength, while we unburdened crawl towards death. See, I did. I I only looked at that for a briefly, and I remember. Go to number two, if I may. Let's see if we can go to number two. Okay, you know this is from Macbeth. Out, out, brief Campbell. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player. The frets and struts his hour across the stage, and then he's heard no more. A tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Oh, uh, can you can you go to number three, please? And, uh, Okay. This comes from Hamlet. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it's not to come. If it be not to come, it will be not now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. If man has aught of what he leaves, what is to leave behind? Let be. Now, these are called mnemonic frames. And, uh, and in, in the book that I've written, it explains how it is done. But it is easy. I remember now 500 of these, okay? And, uh, but it, it's, and I don't have a very good memory. It's just a question of how to filter, to, to um, um, use the system of the mnemonic frame, which was explained by Cicero, which was by, by Quintilian. And then in the Renaissance, when I was doing the research for the book, there were people came up, researchers, scientists of the time, came up with incredibly complex system to remember, which the, the system is as complex, is make it so complex that you cannot remember any what you try to remember. <laughs> but this is different, and uh, it's it's a combination of uh, of software and, and, and psychology, and and it works very well. I've I've, I've experimented with other people too, and so they uh, I have fact because of my website www.dailyshakespeare.com. I don't make any money out of it, but I want to people to attend. Yeah. Um, I have sometimes people correspond, send me a message from overseas. I would like to remember this quotation and so forth. So it's uh, it's and they say yeah and it works. So that has been one of uh, one of uh, my. You asked me before I mean, what have you been doing? Uh, uh, uselessness, but there it is. There it is. To get more information about what you just talked about, in which book do you talk about it? Uh, it will. It will, it will oh, uh, book. Yeah, it's, it's called the Art of Memory in the 21st Century. But I've also I'm trying to incorporate it into the Dante's book, so that people can read the, can find the um, the um, mnemonic quotation from the. You cannot find it here, but they, they put the iPhone here and they get the mnemonic the mnemonic frame. You're hurting my head. I'm an old man. I don't know all this. <laughs> You're not old. Yeah. Yeah, no. Here is the other book that we haven't shown a close picture of. Your, our Daily Dante. 3,500 ways to get away with it, with Dante. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it was. It works. I'm just I'm just like to be vanity. But the first time there was a, a, an Italian senator. He says, could I take you with me to the next Congress? And he was looking at this one to say. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, can we move on? Sure, sure. Yes. Uh, is a war on drugs a war on drugs, or is it a war on the poor? Which is it, Jimmy? Yes. Um, it sounds when when somebody says, or if I say, anyone says, a war on drugs is a war on the poor. So it's like it sounds like some an extraordinary statement to say it is not. It doesn't make any sense what it is, but. If we think again, a little bit of research, a little bit uh, is uh, telling, because it shows how much perception is guided by the media, and how the media can create a frame of mind across millions of people. Now, today, if you say, <coughs> I say I've never, 
I never smoked, not even inhaled marijuana, so I'm not saying that people should go on drugs. However, the, even in this program, as you know, in this studio, there is a very successful movement and, and, and uh, program about uh, freeing marijuana for medical reasons, whatever other reasons. Sure. Which by itself shows that um, it's not set up to be what it is. It's not a crime. And as we know, today there are millions of people in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought that it would be perhaps of interest to viewers of your show to show a little bit what, how the drugs were seen and perceived not so long ago in, in historical recent times to, and to make them, to, for those who are interested, they can see it, to realize the difference of perception that can be, as I said, can be inculcated into the masses of which we are, to which we belong ourselves, and it has nothing to do with reality. So I would like to ask Studio if they can put up, okay, this, this is called Vin Mariani. Oh, this came up in the 1895, and it was popular French tonic wine. Oh. What it was, what it, the, the popularity and the Frenchness was it, the popularity, the Frenchness has nothing to do with it, but the popularity was it a cocaine wine. The word coca leaves were, were seeded in wine. Coca? Coca leaves. So, so okay, go, but it, it becomes even better. Go to the next, please. Okay, this coca wine was even endorsed by Pope Leo the Thirteenth, the one, <coughs> and he was, and the Vatican, give a gold medal to, <laughs> to, to Mr. Mariani for having come up in recognition of benefits received from Vin Mariani, the Those Pope. Catholics, this, he <laughs> was a druggie. He huh? was a drug. Now, exactly, exactly. But can you see the paradox? The paradox we have here, the, the, <laughs> the complete inconsistency. Here we have cocaine as being the engine of crime the engine of the makes the <coughs> prison industrial complex <coughs> alive as well as the others mm -hmm. and here we have a different total perception <coughs> excuse me mm -hmm. about the same thing again here is another um, here is another picture of the pope uh, because he was he was a consumer of this co coca wine and uh, apparently he was able to write encyclicals and, and write it was without he was not certainly wasn't put in prison because of consuming cocaine let's go to the next is that when the Catholicism started its decline, when they started using drugs? No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> there were cocaine tooth, tooth drops, okay? You could use cocaine. It was, you put the cocaine there because... Uh, and there was even <coughs> a Bayer heroin. Bayer, the, uh, this particular uh, heroin, mm -hmm. was sold in pharmacies, and you didn't even have to have a prescription and so forth. The same thing for the cocaine drops. And we're not talking about hundreds of years ago. This is the 1890s, 19, to, up to the 1920s. You got about a minute and a half or two minutes for you to conclude. So to, to the war on the poor, what happens? Mm -hmm. There was the opium, the, which was heroin. Uh, the, at the time, there were the, there was a, when it started becoming bad, considered bad, uh, it wasn't the airlines, it was even given the airlines, <laughs> the amphetamines. <laughs> Uh, was an influx of, of Chinese, and so the Chinese were taking away, they perceived to taking away the job from, from the uh, Americans, so war of opium. Opium became a drug. Then, b b a drug that to, to opium, so the war on Chinese. And then there was, <coughs> then there came the, uh, the Mexicans, the Latin Americans, became immigrating in this country, they were strong on marijuana, so the war on marijuana became the war on the Mexicans. And now, today, uh, the uh, the poor, uh, the the poverty started with the uh, moving from the center of from the downtown to the suburbs first, and now they, all the industries have been gutted. So the poor have nothing else left to do because there are no jobs, to but go on the drugs, and so the war on drugs has now become a war on the poor. I've been very quick. I've been I've, 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 because yeah. we have short, yeah. but that's what I wanted. That was my demonstration. Because <clears throat> all the money that is spent on drugs, is spent on the fighting and the prison industrial industries, could be more, uh, it, it is obviously, it would be better spent in attempting to provide opportunities. Yes, Jimmy, and we got to stop. <laughs> Enough said. It's close to time for us to stop visiting, get ready to say good night, uh, keep your pens and pencils handy. You want to jot down something that we'll show you in the closing credits, and my director is going to give me a warning that says we should show the PSA the public service announcements. And there's the broadcast schedule for when people in Washington County uh, can see this show. And then people in the 
Portland metro area. Can see, never mind. To watch my shows on the web, go to www.donbm.com and click on favorite links. There's a whole uh, number of my shows that are available for you to watch 24-7. And next PSA we have about the American Civil Liberties Union. Without the ACLU, our civil liberties would be in worse shape than they are in right now since uh, Bush. And, uh, uh-oh, the ACLU, I've got to tell you about the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, I've told you already. You get my shows broadcast regularly, regularly by your local public access station. Go to www.pegmedia.org. And uh, other parts of the country, you can learn how to end corporate personhood. Corporate personhood is a bummer. You can go to www.pegmedia.org. I've got to change that. All right, so what else can I tell you now except I want to thank you for watching and I wish we had another hour or two to be with Jimmy because it's just fantastic thank you for oh, thank coming you. on the show again <laughs> Jimmy and thanks to our wonderful crew for coming up and helping us get this show going and to Bello can you hear me Bello <laughs> thank you <laughs> my favorite thought for the day is KFC not Kentucky Fried Chicken Dr. Don's KFC Kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, uh, be friendly, and be charitable. To you too, especially charitable. Thank you for watching, and good night again.